love, friendship, adventures, accidental boob grabs. What do those have in common? They're all anime tropes for better or worse. However, those are more lighthearted and often have to do with shonens or romances. But some anime take a darker turn. A corrupt government taking control and watching over your every move keeping you from unveiling the truth of their sinister motives. Your macabre past tormenting you with guilt for life, trapping you in an eternal cycle of misery, leading you to turn to Overwatch ranked, I meant insanity of course, non-accidental boob grabs. But the biggest of them all, death. Let's think of the word itself, what do we already know about it? D-E-A-T-H, one syllable, Germanic origin, with the denotation being the action or fact of dying or being killed, or the end of the life of a person or organism. But what's the connotation? Well, think of death. What do you think of? Perhaps the color black? Hell? Maybe the devil? Sorrow? Fury? Maybe, uh, Tomi? Meize. Chikara. Kono yo no subite o tenireta o toko koldi roja. Okay, I'll be honest, I just wanted to use that bit because I list quite a few stuff and also the One Piece intro, you get it. But it also surprisingly has a lot to do with the theme of death. Goldie Roger's death made the entire Great Pirate Era and all of One Piece possible. So, at least in anime, death isn't always that sad. It can be a new start, rebirth, the end of hardships, motivations, but it also can be sadness, emotional, and fear. So death is really one of the most versatile pieces of utility in all of anime. Especially because a fictional world isn't bound by the real-life mechanics that prevent stuff like reincarnation and resurrection. So today, I would just like to highlight some of those really special cases. And if you come to agree with me, or just enjoy the content, leave a like and subscribe. But before I get into the video, I just wanted to tell every one of you that your life matters. This video is about death and it is inevitable for everyone, so make the best of what you have left. Death is thought to be inherently a sad thing, but I would first like to highlight the times when it doesn't really have to be. Firstly, let's think simpler and not really deep. Death of certain characters can make you feel happy. The death of a despicable villain with no redeeming qualities can make people ecstatic because it was the final goal of the protagonist who had redeeming qualities. For example, the death of Kibutsuji Muzan, the death of All for One, or the death of Light Yagami. These all satisfy a primal boyish instinct in me saying, yeah, beat up the bad guy. It's really nothing deep and it doesn't have to be, cause it's hype as fuck. And that's honestly just about everything I have to say about that. Bad guy dies and my monkey brain gets happy. But there's another case where death isn't necessarily sad. That case would be when you're coming right back. Death is tragic because the option of returning to the living world also dies, but that is with real world mechanics. In anime, anything is possible. A fox boy ninja, a skull face bookseller, a stretchy rubber boy, a shika noko 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 kosh tan tan. Point is, anything is possible, including returning from the dead. And this too is split into two different cases. The first one is simple resurrection. Let's look at Dragon Ball for a quick second. Someone dies, and then they go find the Dragon Balls to grant them the wish of bringing back their friends. Dragon Ball does this the best, or worst depending on how you look at it, because the characters are always dying and being revived. So much so that if Goku dies in the next arc, no one would really care. And while that can be seen as a problem, as it makes everything they're fighting for somewhat watered down, it still is an instance of death being not sad. The other level of this is reincarnation. This often accompanies many isekais as the crux of their story. Loser dies to truck Kun and is revived in a different world as a different person to live a power fantasy as still a loser, but an overpowered one where every girl constantly wants his dick. Sound familiar? I'm not gonna go into any critiques of the genre and just how goddamn overused it is, but the idea holds merit to how intriguing it can be. Going to a different world sounds sick because Life can suck sometimes, and many stories use death as a transition to said world. These forms of death don't hold anything more than it does on the surface. It's just reincarnation. The cases of being reincarnated as slime, a vending machine, a villainess, or the son of a big idol all happen due to this simple transition. 
And because we are on the topic of deaths being the start of a new world, I feel the need to talk a little bit more about One Piece. Now, obviously One Piece is not an isekai, but the death of Goldie Roger is what ultimately started the Great Pirate Era. So in a way, he changed the world in a grand enough way to be able to somewhat call it an isekai. Just some food for thought. Another form of death, or rather way death is utilized, is as a motivation for something. And this can get really complicated. The most simple occurrence of this is the fear of death. In Demon Slayer, the Demon Slayers fight the demons because they and innocent people are scared of dying. Ichigo does what he does because he doesn't want his family and close ones to die. Many cartoon villains act deviously to reach eternal life. While it's really obvious, people don't want to die. It's the most simple, primal instinct every organism has. And many shows take this very simple concept and twist it a little to create their story. The other counterpart of wishing longevity for oneself is wishing shortgevity upon others, meaning someone wants to kill someone. And those two often work in tandem with each other because the choices are often to kill the bad guy or be killed. The primary goal in Demon Slayer is to kill Kibutsuji Muzan. Why did they do that? To ensure life and the safety of innocent people. It gets more interesting than this though. Sometimes, characters want to die, or at least don't mind it. Undead Unluck is all about Andy being unable to die and befriending Fuko in hopes that her unluck power can kill him. It's silly, but it also raises the question, is eternal life happiness? In this case, no. Andy has lived for so long and has seen so much shit that he just doesn't want to live any longer. He's seen loved ones die, he's been alone for a long time, and he's not necessarily depressed or anything, but he's jaded, worn out, and tired. Similarly, in one of my favorite animes of all time, ZOM 100 Bucket List of the Dead, the main character Akira becomes worn out and tired in a toxic office environment. And when finally a zombie apocalypse breaks out, Akira is overjoyed. He can finally start truly living life and doing all the stuff he has wanted to do. And the philosophy of the show is very unique. The title of the show in Japanese and the title of Akira's bucket list is Zombi ni naru made shitai hyaku no koto, which translates to The Hundred Things I Want to Do Before Becoming a Zombie. Akira expects to die doing all the stupid shit, but he's pent up and feels that it is better to die than not be able to do the stuff he desires. Want a cold beer in hand while the streets of Japan are flooded with zombies? Well, let's go get that beer. Want sushi? Not a problem. And even in the end, when he might actually die, at least he has had one good day beforehand. That is the philosophy of ZOM 100. It's not really a hopeful message. It's not that even with a zombie outbreak that there is hope. It's quite frankly just a lovable guy doing all the things he couldn't do and expecting to die along the way. But they even delve into the other, more logical counterpart. Because Shizuka, another character's note, is called 100 things I need to do to not become a zombie. But while doing those things, she seems miserable. Up until then, her life sucked and she was taught to only ever do what she needed to and not what she wanted. So when the apocalypse happened, she stayed trapped in that mindset to not enjoy life and only do what's necessary. It isn't until Akira shows her how fun things can be where she also switches her mindset. And because of all this, I honestly think that it would be an insane artistic power move to ultimately kill off those characters. Because even then, it might not necessarily be a sad ending. Akira still got what he wanted, he wanted to live in the moment and do the stuff he wanted to do. After seeing the end of the anime, I doubt this is the direction they're going, but I personally think that it would send a really powerful message. There exists a few more special cases of this that I would like to mention. Most notably, in Jujutsu Kaisen. In the first episode of JJK, Yuji's grandfather says on his deathbed to be surrounded by people by the time Yuji would inevitably die. And to do that, Yuji must help people and be kind. Later, Yuji swallows Sukuna's finger and is doomed to be executed in the future after ingesting all of them. He expects to die, but he still takes his grandfather's advice and makes friends while he is alive to have people be around him, love him, and mourn for him when he will also meet his fate. And yes, I also think Yuji should die in the end because that was the original goal, to be with others when he dies. And you can't really have that if you don't die. But from the direction the manga went, I 
don't think Yuji will die from the original cause, but I still think that he should eventually die. Maybe just show us on his deathbed when he grows old, just like his grandfather, with the difference being that many people are there with him. But the wording on his grandfather's advice is very specific and well thought out. The sentiment and the overall message to Yuji is to be kind to people and live a happy life. But the focus was more on the death part. His grandfather could have told him to live a happy life with many loved ones, but he didn't. He said to die happily with many people who love you back. And I like that about JJK. They aren't afraid to use death as a major theme. Many of the characters that you will come to love will just be taken from you. The whole show is about death and the final goal too involves the death of Yuji. And this piece of advice was the very beginning of this journey. Someone who didn't take that advice is our friend Freerin from, well, Freerin. As an elf, Freerin has an incredibly long lifespan and she therefore didn't really get close to her party members. To her, the time she spent with them was just a tiny portion of her life. Only when they grow old and die does she realize her mistake. She never thought of death. She never felt the urgency to get close to humans as they are but a tiny speck in her long life. And only when it is too late does she realize her mistake and start another journey, this time trying her best to get closer to humans. Freerin is a fascinating piece of art that uses that initial irony to set up a bittersweet, melancholic, yet also hopeful story. I've only read some of the manga and I can already see how beautiful this can be, and I'm excited for the anime which I have held off for way too long. Again, I would like to see Fern and Stark eventually die, but happy with Freerin having no regrets with them. That ending would be depressing, but also joyous as Freerin reached her goal to have humans that she is close to. The final series of uses is, quite frankly, an anticlimactic one. It's the death of someone to use as an emotional effect. Honestly, it's kind of a cheat code. I shouldn't have given two shits when Kari from Your Lion April died, but somehow, a small part of me disregarded the horrible asshole that she was and kind of felt sad. I never cared about Neji from Naruto, but when he died, it was sad. Ideally, the deaths of characters as an emotional impact should be cultivated more naturally and efficiently, but even without all that, it still does stuff to you. Something unexplainable, something primitive and natural. Because death means it's over. We won't see any more of the insufferable asshole that Kaori is. We won't see more of Neji alive and kicking. We won't see more of Ace, or Midnight Sensei, or Muichiro, or Senku's dad, or L, or Jiraiya, or Setsuko, or Koro, or I. We simply won't, and that's what makes it so sad. And out of any show I've seen, I think Oshinoko exhibits the most of them. The deaths in that show are really deep and well thought out. Expected from someone of Aka Akasaka's caliber who you may know if you've read or seen Kaguya-sama Love is War. The first major death in the show is the death of Aqua's past life. This happens in the tropey isekai way of being murdered. I think it's safe to say that no one really thought much of that scene. Ruby's past life is also cut short due to a terminal illness and both of them are reincarnated as the twins of Aya Hoshino. And when they're reborn, their life seems to be going great even along the rough patches. They both admire their mom, their mom loves them, it's nice. But that happy life and mood of the story is also cut short by the murder of Ai from a deranged fan. Look at all the stuff this death did. Made me and anyone who has a heart emotional, so emotional, check. Motivated Aqua to find his biological dad who had set this murder up and kill him and then himself, so motivation, check. Aqua isn't afraid of death as he has experienced it before and has the resolve to let nothing stop him, so not being scared of death, check. And there's of course the isekai stuff from the beginning, so isekai, check. And to top it all off, even the killer kills himself over the regret of his actions. Oshinoko doesn't just simply use them either. They tactfully and masterfully handle all of these subjects. The scene of Ai's death had many layers to it relating to death and not. Because the story also has love as one of its big themes. Ai isn't able to love anyone truly and lies to her fans about her feelings for them. Ai is afraid to tell Aqua and Ruby that she loves them because she is afraid that it might also feel like a lie. Even the killer acted out of love in a way. A sick, twisted, deranged form of love that made him commit a drastic action because he found out that Ai was sharing her love with someone else. It's an infinitely deep hole that doesn't get looked at enough even though it is already looked at a shit ton. I haven't tried to hide it, but I do love death in anime. 
It's a fascinating thing that can often make extremely bold artistic statements about a piece, so it really bugs me that too many anime are scared to utilize it. They often use shitty nameless side characters as dedicated dead people or BS the important ones back into life. Look at Attack on Titan for example. First of all, let me get this out of the way. It's gonna be controversial, but I didn't think that show was a good one. Hear me out before any angry comments though. A big part of what I didn't like about it is their underutilization of death. Now hear me out. The concept of the show is sick as hell and the titans are supposed to pose a huge threat. But the only people we ever really see dying to the titans are Eren's mom and unimportant side characters, so I don't feel that threat. I know no one important is gonna die, but when a nameless character randomly and suddenly starts getting a little more screen time, we know their asses are gonna die. But we don't care about them, so it doesn't create an emotional impact, nor does it make the titans seem scary. If they let an important character die, we would feel so much more impact. We would think, oh shit, things are getting serious. That is what JJK did. So many people who everyone thought was important end up dead. And look at the moment Nanami or Junpei died. It made me truly realize the cruelty of the show and how anyone can die. Even something like Domestic Girlfriends. They seemed reluctant to kill off Hina and we got that shit show of an ending. And even though it doesn't involve death technically, Food Wars falls into this trap. We often know who's passing and who's not, so we don't feel that gravity of the strict schooling that happens. Expel someone from the dorm for good. Expel someone who we thought was going to be important for good. We would again think, oh shit, it's serious. I want to see characters die. I want to be heartbroken. I want to think, wait, but that character had so much ahead of them. What about their goals and dreams? What about doing anything with them? Not some rando who I have zero emotional connection to. I certainly don't care about Titan Food 1, 2, and 3. I don't care about Nameless Marines A, B, and C, nor Konoha Shinobi's Do, Re, and Mi. And because shows often realize this, they give those randos a random sad backstory out of nowhere to make us care. But those characters are still inherently nobodies. Kinda like what they did with Marco in AOT. And if you don't know who Marco is, there you go, my point is proven. He's this generic filler character designed mofo. He was never really a part of anything and showed up maybe once during the training arc. And then randomly, right before he died, he started getting more screen time and we got to learn more about him. But guess what? That doesn't do anything. He was still the forgettable loser who no one loves and I think it's safe to say that no one cared about him. But I do think that there are some deaths that were handled very well. Most notably, we have Ace from One Piece, L from Death Note, Rengoku from Demon Slayer, Sir Night Eye and All Might as a hero from My Hero, Neji from Naruto, somewhat, and most of the JJK ones. In all of those cases, we got to know enough about the characters to make the audience care about them and they seem to have a promising place in the future of the story. But so suddenly, we were filled with sorrow as their great lives were turned to, well, not lives. And that kind of stuff is what creates emotion, a death of someone who has so much ahead of them. Again, what makes a character's death sad is their entire story being cut short. They need to have a promising place in the future of the show. We need to be able to imagine them in the end. Then, when everything is cut short, we can have a genuine emotional impact. As I said earlier, using death in this way is like a cheat code. You tend to feel for characters you never even cared about, and if they add some actual character building, it would be that much more impactful. I think I've talked about death for long enough. It's quite a gloomy subject, but it can also be happy and motivating. And because of how intriguing that subject is to me, I just felt the need to mention it. If there's one takeaway from this video, it should be KILL PEOPLE in anime so that I don't get in trouble. Kill off characters, don't be scared, create an extra character, give him many potential stories, then mercilessly kill him off. That will really raise the bar of threat and emotional impact. Finally, I would again like to let you know that your life matters. Go live happily and also eventually when your time comes, die happily. My name is Nobo Okoa, try to better your life starting today, except for Classroom of the Elite Enjoyers, Malga Players, Power Scalers, and people who put gum under school desks and chairs. But to everyone else, thank you for watching.